Who's ready to get into the Word today? So the title of my message today is Free to Be Your Best. When God places a calling on your life, He expects you to do your best with it. And as I've shared so many times, just because my name's Pastor, I'm not the only one with a calling on my life. Each and every one of us are called to be a part of the body of Christ. And I've been teaching about unity and I've been teaching about being a functional part of the body of Christ for a long time now. Because even if you're the little toe on the body of Christ and you're not functioning in the way that you should, you're weakening the body of Christ. I'm not telling you that to make you feel bad. I'm just telling you that there's a responsibility that comes with being a child of God. It's not all about the benefits. There are lots of benefits. But there are some responsibilities that God requires of us. But when God puts a responsibility on you, He doesn't just give you the responsibility and leave you to flounder on your own. He empowers you to be able to fulfill the calling in your life. Because I guarantee you, without the power of the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't be standing in this desk today. I've said it over and over again. I was very shy, very backward as a kid. I had my friends, but when it came to speaking in front of people, talking to groups at a time, I wasn't your guy. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe you think I'm still not. I don't know. You keep showing up every Sunday. I don't know. Can we get Colossians 2, verses 6 through 23 up on the screen? I'm going to be going through this today. I'm going to go ahead and read through all of it, and then we're going to go back through little bits of it throughout my message today. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. If you have your device, turn that on. If you have neither, it's going to be on the screen behind me and in front of me. But I don't want you all turning around. I don't want to see the back of your head. Give me an amen when you get there. That's enough of you. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way and having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding to a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding those things into which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, Why, as though living in the world, do you still subject yourselves to the regulations of it? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Which of all concern things which perish with using according to the commandments and doctrines of men, 
These things have indeed an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion and false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. That's a lot to chew in one bite. But like my daddy always said, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. If there's one thing I can say that I have in my life that I have received from my parents, that whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. I love that philosophy of life for this reason. It never limits a person to what someone else thinks they should be. My dad always told me, son, you can do whatever you put your mind to do. And he had that confidence in me and it gave me confidence in myself. It allowed me to be the best that I could be according to my own talents, my personality, my abilities, my intelligence, or lack thereof. <laughs> so I may not preach like Billy Graham or pastor the largest church in Nevada, but I will do the very best I can with the abilities that God has given me and the calling He's placed on my life. However, many of you Many will never experience their best. And I'll explain why in a minute. First, I want to start with a story of Deion Sanders. Some of you may have heard of him, a Hall of Fame football player. For at least one season, he was an outfielder for the Atlanta Braves and a cornerback for the Atlanta Falcons. And he's the only athlete to ever hit a major league home run and score an NFL touchdown in the same week. I remember as a teenager watching the stories of him flying in a helicopter from the baseball game to the football game just so that he could be there in time to be in the starting lineup for the Braves after playing for the Falcons that afternoon. And it always amazed me. Grew up with Bo Jackson who played football and baseball at the same time. And just to have that talent is just amazing that it's so astronomically slim odds for you to make it to the pros in one sport, but they have the ability to do two. But when it came to Dion, he grew up on the mean streets of Fort Myers, Florida, where exposure to some would-be athletes spurred him to make a success of himself. He explains, I call them Idas. I'd have done this, I'd be making $3 million today. If I had to practice a little harder, I'd be a superstar. They were as fast as me when they were kids, but instead of working for their dreams, they chose drugs and a life of street on the corners. On street corners, sorry. When I was young, I had to practice. My friends who didn't went straight to the streets and never left. That moment after school is the moment that we need to grab. We don't need any more Idas. Anybody out there have any Idas in their life? If I'd have done this, if I'd have done that. You see, I was prophesied over at 17 and told I was going to be a pastor. And at 17, that scared the water out of me and I ran. And I ended up prolonging the call of God in my life. But thanks be to God, His callings are without. <laughs> he always, if He begins a good work in you, He will see it to completion. And I thank God that He is using me today. And I can't allow the idas in my life to take away from what He's doing in me today. So if you've got some of those, I'd have done this, I'd have done that, you've got to learn to let go in order for you to live in the here and now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yes. We don't need any more idas in our life. If your name's Ida, I apologize today. <laughs> God has given you everything you need to be the best Christian that you can be. He admonishes us in His Word very much the same way that my parents encouraged me. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, He said, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Remember the last few weeks I've been talking about and dating myself with the WWJD thing, what would Jesus do? My new standard of living isn't what would Jesus do, but what I am getting ready to do is it going to bring glory to God. You see, for me, that's a better measuring stick than thinking what would Jesus do. I know what Jesus would do. But what am I going to do? Because it's my choice. 
Am I going to do the thing that brings glory to God or am I going to do the thing that brings shame to His name? Sorry if I stepped on your toes. You have a Heavenly Father who's asking the same thing from you, but not only is He asking, like I said, He's empowering you to do it. So the first thing that He does in order to empower us is He frees us from deception. That's number one. In verses 6-8 to eight it says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. The important message is that once you have become a Christian, that you continue in Him. The one little phrase is so important because everything is either in Him or it's in the world. You see, we're either all in with God or we're all out with God. We can't straddle the fence any longer. God says we're either in Him, we're either for Him, or we're against Him. There's no standing still in God. You're either moving forward in your relationship with God, or you're falling backward in your relationship with God. I preached a message several weeks ago about being lukewarm. God doesn't want us lukewarm. He either wants us on fire or He doesn't want us at all. He says if we're lukewarm, He'll spit us out of His mouth. Hmm. Now Paul very specifically states that there's really only one to, way to live in Him, and that is to be, verse 7 says, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You see that word rooted literally means to become stable. Built up in Him could also be translated as built upon Him, because He is the solid rock and the foundation of our life. The only way to live in Him is to be stable and by building our foundation on Jesus and not relying upon ourselves, You see, we rely upon ourselves so much, we think that we can do it in our own strength. We spend all of our time fighting the battle in our own strength when Jesus says He's willing to fight the battle for us. It says that you will be strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Do you see that? Taught. Teaching involves both a teacher and a student as well as a willingness to learn. And the longer I'm a Christian, the more I find that I don't know everything, but I'm willing to find out. Just because I have pastor in front of my name doesn't mean I have all the answers. So many people come to me and, and just assume that I know, like I'm the Bible encyclopedia. Sometimes I have to tell you I don't know, but I'll find out. Teaching is so important, we have to have a teachable spirit, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean that I don't have somebody teaching me. We all have to have somebody that we allow to speak into our life and, and teach us and to be our shepherd. I have a pastor of pastors that, that helps me, that's had years of experience, that guides me and leads me and helps me in circumstances that I just don't know. But my chief teacher is the Holy Spirit. Because He says He will reveal to me all truth and lead me back to Jesus every single time. Ephesians 2, 19-22 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. You see, Paul says, we are to be strengthened in faith that comes from the hearing of the Word of God over and over. How do we get faith? By hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I can't encourage you enough to stay rooted in the Word of God. Because that is where your faith grows. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for, to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. <laughs> the righteousness of God revealed to us from faith to faith. And we shall live by faith. 
We have to understand that if we are built up in Him, we'll be strengthened in our faith as we were taught. Verse 8 warns us, See that no one takes you captive through hollow deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. You see, the word philosophy means fondness for wise things. But that's from a human perspective. Philosophy is deceptive and at the same time can be persuasive even though it comes from human tradition rather than from Christ. Even some Christians are easily deceived because they have not been rooted in the Word of God. That's why I encourage you, be in the Word. Be in the Word. Be in the Word some more. That's why I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights to Family Night Bible Study. We learn more and more of the Word of God. We learn more and more of who God is to us and who we are in Him. But again, if all you eat is what I feed you on Sunday and what I feed you on Wednesday, you will become spiritually sick. We have to be rooted in the Word by our own will and desire. Matthew 20, 24, 24 said of this very thing in the last days, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great, great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Can you think of a better reason to stay in Christ than so that you're not deceived? We can be free of deception if we stay rooted in Him and we build our life and foundation upon the person of Jesus Christ. The second thing, we are free from condemnation. This is the big one. Verse 9 says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So let's go back to the phrase, in Him or in Christ. We know that Jesus, being the incarnate Word of God, was fully God, yet fully man. In Him, the fullness of God lives in bodily form. But the same holds true for those who are in Christ. We have been given the fullness of God through our faith in Jesus. Verse 10 says, And you have been given the fullness of Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Power and authority is referring to demonic forces, and you have the same authority over them that Jesus has. Luke 10.19 says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now I have a little meme on my phone. And it says, yes, I'm Pentecostal. No, I don't handle snakes. So, (laughs) some of you will get that later. But the same enemy that you've been given authority over continues to hammer the church with lies and innuendos, stealing, killing, and destroying your faith. So what is it that keeps you from being the very best that you can be in the kingdom of God? It's the lies that you allow the enemy to sow into your life and implant into your mind. The devil only has as much control over you as you allow him to have. And the mind is his playground. That's why it's so important that we keep that helmet of salvation and we keep that breastplate of righteousness to guard our hearts and our minds so that the enemy can't plant those seeds of doubt, those seeds of fear, those seeds of anxiety, those condemnations of your past, the condemnation of your sin. Hmm. The enemy just continues to condemn you by saying you aren't good enough to make a difference. Everybody remembers how you used to be. You'll never change. You can't do this. And we believe the lies rather than the Word of God. Sometimes we hear, I can't be an effective witness for Christ, but yet the Word says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to become My witnesses. The enemy says you can't, but the Word says you can. You might think, I can't give up my habits. I'm bound by them. But Romans 6.18 says you have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. So the only thing keeping you from being set free from the things that bind you is the fact that you can't accept the truth of God's Word. You're set for... I had two teeth pulled yesterday, so I'm kind of talking over myself here. The only thing keeping you from being set free from the things that bind you is the fact you can't accept the truth. You've been set free from fear. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. 
You see, you're loosed from the bond of, of addictive substances. You've been released from submitting to the lust of the flesh. Psalm 119.61 says, Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. The Word of God clearly states that your legal rights as children of God because you are in Him. Verse 11 says, In Him you have put off the sinful nature, not with circumcision done by hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ. And that is a direct result of your confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Lord, hmm. It is at that time that you become a child of God. And if a child of God co-heirs with Christ to all the promises of God, Satan has spent centuries lying to the church, telling us that we can't change anything and that we don't have the power to do anything. We just have to take whatever comes our way. So tired of living that life of, oh, if I can just drag myself to eternity, it'll all be better there. We can live a victorious Christian life. Yes. Yes, we can. Is it going to be easy? Is it a bed of roses? No. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Amen. Amen. We can live a life of blessing in Christ. We can actually live the life of Christ because it's placed within us when we accept Him. The enemy tells us we're not good enough to make a difference or change our lives. And in a sense, he's right because we try and obtain the righteousness through the requirements of the law on our own power. And when we do that, it's powerless. The law was given to show us that we were sinners. And it was given to us to show that we needed a Savior, somebody to come that could fulfill that law because we couldn't. So let's jump down to verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. That is what happens when you give your life to Christ. It isn't the law of Moses that loses its value to the church. It's that you're no longer condemned because of your inability to keep the law of Moses. The condemnation of the written code has been abolished and the power and authority of the enemy over the lives of unbelievers is canceled along with it. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. The problem is that the church doesn't realize the full potential of the power and authority that we have in Him. The power and authority of God's children, His heirs and stewards to the promise of the earth was brought to completion with the church with the mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're Pentecostal. It's okay to be Pentecostal. It's not a bad word. <laughs> now I have to find my place again. It's the abuse or lack of our spiritual power, the use of our spiritual power that has brought the church to a place of spiritual weakness or lethargy. You see, I've used this story before, but I think it bears repeating today. One New Year's Day in the Tournament of Roses Parade, a beautiful float suddenly sputtered and quit. It was out of gas. The whole parade was held up until somebody could get a can of gas for the truck. The amusing thing was this float represented the Standard Oil Company. With its vast oil resources, its truck was out of gas. How often as we Christians who are clothed in power find ourselves out of gas. The last thing, we're free from tradition. You know, recently we've had some really good attendance for our services. Not only have we had good attendance, but we're experiencing the move of the Holy Spirit in our services. But it's these types of moves that cause people to label us as radical or holy rollers or crazies or whatever they want to call us. It is because we don't do things the way they think it ought to be done. When I took over, I told you I was tired of doing church the same way every week. I was tired of trying to schedule it out minute by minute and have some agenda that I needed to be done by a certain time. And I apologize, we're going on 12.30 and I'm still not done today. Come on now. I don't speak 
<laughs> I know, they put that on the back wall for some reason with really big red letters, so I guess the pastor can see it. But hey, lunch is being provided Amen. after service, so. <laughs> Even my grandbaby's are excited. We've been set free from the traditions of men that bind us and we move in the freedom of the Spirit of God in this church. I believe that's one reason that we've seen attendance grow, we've seen people come, is because God is here and His presence is here. I take no credit. I'm humbled by the fact that He uses me as His instrument. I just try and stay out of the way and try and speak the words that the Holy Spirit lays on my heart every week. You see, we don't have to worship a certain way. And it's okay to dance in the Spirit. It's okay to speak in tongues. It's okay to fall under the anointing of the power of God. Those are all okay things. It's it's not a bad thing. It's okay to weep in the presence of a holy God. I told you guys I've stopped apologizing a long time ago for how emotional I get when the Holy Spirit touches my heart. It's just who I am and and what God does in me that allows my emotions to flow free and I'm not ashamed anymore. We're not bound by the past or by what seems to be normal according to the natural, but the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit moving in our midst. The traditions that men set in place have no spiritual value if they cannot do anything for you. The traditions that men set in place have no value if they cannot do anything for you. We have so many traditions that we allow to become almost sacred cows to us. And if somebody messes with our sacred cow, we get all ticked off and we go try and find a church that won't mess with our sacred cow. (laughs) Then we find out the problem is staring back at us in the mirror. (laughs) much like the law of Moses which could only show you your sin and not remove it these traditions get in our way a right relationship with Christ means being saved from sin but the fullness of that relationship is found in the baptism of the Holy Spirit you see when we become saved The Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us power. Like I said, God doesn't give you a responsibility and not give you the power to complete it. He doesn't leave you stranded. He doesn't leave you powerless. He doesn't leave you vulnerable. He gives you the power of the Holy Spirit to do these things. Verse 18 says, Do not let any one who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. What does God cause to grow? The whole body. But how does that happen? It happens when we stay connected to the head, which is in Christ Jesus. False humility says God is a God of order and not of confusion, so I would never act like that in church. You see, I grew up in a pretty traditional Assembly of God church, and I thought I'd seen moves of the Spirit, and I thought I'd seen the power of God. I witnessed Jericho marches around the church and seen people slain in the Spirit. We moved to Oklahoma. We went to this church. And the worship leader danced like crazy while she led worship. And that made me uncomfortable. I, I was like, I can't even enter into worship. I'm distracted by this crazy lady dancing all over the state. But the Holy Spirit convicted me. It's like, that's the way she worships me. How can you, how can you criticize what she does? Another thing that I'm going to confess, pastoral confession time, the flag waving thing. 
I just could never get with the flag waving thing. To me, it was just something that was distracting me from being focused on God. We actually had a lady in our church in Portola, and we actually asked her, if you're going to wave your flag, do it in the back of the church. Well, guess who got convicted by the Holy Spirit for asking somebody to worship differently than I worship? You see... (laughs) The Holy Spirit moves us in different ways. I get emotional. I tear up. I cry. Some of you may raise your hand. Some of you may dance. Some of you may have a little flag and I'll let you wave it. I'm not encouraging that, by the way. But if the Holy Spirit leads you, I won't discourage you. We don't have a very big church. You have to be a small flag. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. It says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed from their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with the unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, we're being changed into His likeness according to His Word. And, according to the tr- and not according to the traditions of men. Men t- want, tend to want to create God in their image instead of conforming ourselves to God's image. Yeah. I've always said that sometimes we put God in a human-sized box because our finite thinking can't think of the power of God. We can't think of the infinite, omnipotent power of God because we're only human. But if we tap into God's Word and we allow the Holy Spirit to show us, then we would walk around with less fear, less anxiety in our life because we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Creator of the universe who made you and me and made the rocks and the mountains and the trees And His creation screams His glory. The Bible says if we refuse to praise the Lord, the rocks will cry out. I don't want any rocks singing in Reno. Amen? (laughs) Amen. Paul's last words on this topic is this. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining the sensual indulgence. Traditions do not free you, they bind you. It may sound right, it may even look right, But when traditions of men begin to take precedence over the Word of God, we have a problem in the church. Traditions change, but God's Word never changes. The culture may change, but God's Word never changes. The faces in the crowd may change, but God's Word never changes. This community may change. This city may change. This state may change, but God's Word will never change. And I will continue to preach the uncompromised Word of God as long as I have this desk. Besides, which one would you rather trust? The tradition that has its foundation in the world or this church that has its foundation on the Word? Faith, if you could come back. I'm going to grab some water for a second. As faith comes, I just want to share with you that every week I can see that you as a church are becoming more and more of what God intended this church to be. And I know that makes the enemy of your soul nervous. The attacks have begun. Sickness and disease have drawn their battle lines. Family problems are becoming increasingly prominent. For many of you, the desire of the old life is calling to you from the distance to come back to what you once were. 
The enemy is continually repeating the lies that you have no authority, that you have no power, and that the old life was much better than the one you're living today. Lies. All lies. He's a father of lies, a father of deception. Don't listen. But you are free from the deception because you know the truth, and the truth has made you free. The accuser of the brethren stands condemning you every day. He's planting the seed in your mind that you're not good enough. That if you were really a Christian, you would be more tolerant of those who don't believe the way that you believe or worship the way that you worship. If you were so good and so righteous, why do you still sin? And if you do sin, then who are you to judge others in their lifestyle and their sin? But we have freedom from condemnation because you have an intercessor who sits at the right hand of the Father. I've been telling you for the last few weeks that not only is Jesus praying for you, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you as well. So if you feel like you're not getting enough prayer for you in this church, just know that the Holy Spirit is making intercession for you. Know that Jesus Christ is making intercession for you and He's praying for you. Because He can say the words, the Holy Spirit can say the words that we can't even comprehend or think about of the things that we need. Who better to pray for you than Jesus Himself? Finally, the enemy even works through the well-intentioned believer who misunderstand the working of the Holy Spirit or even those who are not so (laughs) well-intentioned who watch and wait for the supernatural to occur in our churches only to rail against the very things that God desires to do under the pretense of church tradition. We've never done it that way before. I'm sorry, but we're going to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do in this church. There's nothing more for the enemy would rather do than to bring the Holy Spirit move to a halt in churches today. But you have the freedom from tradition because God has promised that these things will follow those who believe. In My name you will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues and they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, I'm not saying we're going to chase signs, miracles, and wonders because when we start chasing after what we want, we take our focus off the One who can do the signs, miracles, and wonders. So I guess my question to you today is are you willing to be the best that you can be? I think of Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh brought out the best in Moses. I think about Samson and the lion, and the lion brought out the best in Samson. I think about David and Goliath, and Goliath brought out the best in David. And then I think about Jesus and the cross. And the cross brought out the best in Jesus. It's time for us to take a stand against the enemy and find freedom that God has for you in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit.